Hey Amen. I love the I love the worship songs too this morning as well. I thought the the worship songs were great. The reason why I love them is that they were so full of good, sound doctrine. And I remember years ago when we first sang uh, Jeff Bullock's song "This Kingdom." I always remember that that song was just so full of just good teaching. And you know what? It's, it's, it's very important to have good doctrine, to have sound doctrine, because we live out of what we believe. And so when we're singing it, it becomes internalized, and then we can just uh, you know, live it out in our lives. So what we believe uh, is connected to how we live our lives. Right believing leads to right behavior, so to speak. But uh, this morning, yes, I wanted to talk about, uh, let's see if this works, is it not? Oh, cool. So the title of the message is, Our Sins Forgiven and Forgotten. So one of the greatest truths that we have received in Jesus under the new covenant is the total and eternal forgiveness of all of our sins through the finished work of Christ on the cross. It is a part of the spiritual blessings that we have been gifted with in Christ. So if we move. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I love that. We are accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. You know, I would hear this, I would hear this term that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, and it's great, you know, we said, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. But then I'd wonder what those blessings were. But they're right here in this passage. So let's go to that one. So the spiritual blessings in Christ, obviously, you know, when Phil was giving his communion message, there's a there's a lot of blessings that we've received in Christ through the blood of Jesus and and what he has done for us through redemption. But in particular, in this scripture, he, God the Father, chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. That's the Father, in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself. And to the praise of the glory of his grace, he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So this morning I want to highlight uh, the fact that we have truly received forgiveness for our sins and from God's perspective, how our sins have been forgotten by him, never to be brought up again. And you know what that sounds like? That sounds like the gospel. That sounds like good news. Good news. So what the cross of Jesus accomplished for us was so powerful that it cleansed us of all our sins, past, present, and our future sins. Our future sins as well, yes, our future sins as well. And it's easy to grasp and believe that our past and present sins have been dealt with for sure. But for many believers, it's more difficult to believe that our future sins are forgiven as well. Basically, the popular religious perspective would be that when we sin, that when we sin as believers, we must confess our sins to be forgiven, to be made right with God again. And I think most of us here would understand that perspective. I do, I get it. Um, I was there for a long time until I had the revelation of, of God's grace. And um, let me put this over here. When I was a, uh, 
a young Christian, this kind of mentality uh, used to just consume my thinking. Am I right with God? Am I right with God? Oh, I just sinned. Now I'm in a state of separation from God. You know, I'm on the outs with God. Fellowship is, uh, is broken with him until I repent and confess my sins. And then all is well. Fellowship is restored until the next time I sin. And then this whole vicious cycle just repeats over and over again. So when it came time to pray, the majority of my time was spent getting right with God. And do you know how much that hampers intimacy and relationship with God? It hampers it a lot. And there is no relationship or rest or peace when we have this old covenant mentality. It makes God seem so unapproachable. It's not like coming to a loving Heavenly Father. It's, it's like being called to the principal's office. <laughs> There's a level of fear involved. And you just, it's just like the children of Israel. They feared to approach God. And they asked Moses to approach in their stead. So in this scripture it says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. That's interesting. For the worshippers would have been purified once for all time. And their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead... Those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So note that for Israel under the old covenant, the sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again and again and again, year after year. And that sounded so familiar to me. In retrospect, when I looked back, when I would approach God in prayer and ask God for forgiveness again and again and again. And yet those sacrifices were totally powerless to provide perfect cleansing. If these sacrifices could have provided perfect cleansing, then those sacrifices would have stopped. Because the Israelites, those who worshipped God, would have received total forgiveness of their sin and would no longer have been conscious of their sin. Their guilt and shame would have disappeared. They would no longer fear the judgment of God. They wouldn't be under any condemnation. Unfortunately, the blood of bulls and goats was totally impotent to provide true cleansing of sin. And in fact, all it ever did was remind them that they were sinners. So every time Joe Israelite would would, uh, uh, would bring a goat or a bull to the tabernacle of Moses or the temple for sacrifice. It was just a stark reminder that he was a sinner. And man, that is, that is how I used to feel. I used to feel that way. Coming to God in prayer and worship, I was so conscious of my sin that I would spend the first 15, 20 minutes, maybe even longer than that, confessing my sin, asking God for forgiveness, and so when I felt like I had repented enough, when I felt like I was, I felt like I was forgiven, when I felt uh, holy enough, I guess you could say, then and only then did I feel like I could pray with any sort of authority, you know. And I felt spiritual until the next time I sinned and then went back to the drawing board. It was just a total lack of understanding of what Jesus had accomplished on the cross. I was in total ignorance at the time. But I'm sure many of us can relate to that. But God was gracious even in those times, and especially in those times, because God is good. God is a loving, heavenly Father. And He is so patient with us. So patient with us. But the truth is, we're not under the old covenant, we're under a new covenant. It's a far superior covenant. In the book of Hebrews, we speak of a better covenant based on better promises. 
You see, that was the old economy. That was the old religious system of law. And praise God, we are not under that old covenant. And we never were. That only ministered death and condemnation. Paul says, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, what was written and engraved on stones of the Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Moses covered his face because the glory that was on his countenance was actually fading. The ministry of the law, the old covenant ministers death. And it's fading, it's dying. But the ministry of the Spirit and righteousness gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. The more we look into the face of Jesus Christ, we can go from glory to glory, from faith to faith in him. Amen. Now, where was I? Hallelujah. What the blood of bulls and goats was powerless to do, that is, they could not provide perfect and complete cleansing of all sin. Well, that's exactly what the blood of Jesus did for you and I. His sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice that happened once for all, and once for all time, never to be repeated again. You see, God is not in the business of forgiving the believer's sin when we ask over and over and over again. Why? Because all of our sins were done away with when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And I love these verses here. In Hebrews 10.10, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Romans 6.10, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. Hebrews 10.14, For by one offering... He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If the forgiveness of sin was dependent on our continual confession of sin, then what of the blood of Jesus? What of his finished work at the cross? You know, when we think of the blood of Jesus, are we comparing the blood of Jesus to the blood of bulls and goats? The blood of bulls and goats could only temporarily cover sin and yet when we as Christians sin we feel like we've got to come and offer up our own sacrifices of confession when the blood of Jesus once for all for all time has taken our sins away so I'll repeat that if the forgiveness of sin was dependent on our continual confession of sin then what of the blood of Jesus what of the finished work on the cross Andrew Farley if I can get him up. <laughs> oh, yes. So, Andrew Farley here, he says, because Jesus is not in heaven dying over and over, we're not down here on earth being forgiven over and over. So, for example, the Roman Catholic would believe that his or her sin is progressively forgiven as they confess in a confessional booth to a priest Or the Protestant believes that his or her sin are forgiven as they make confession to God, you know, without a priest, on an ongoing basis. But whether you make confession of sin through a priest or to God himself, it fails to take into account the once-for-all forgiveness and cleansing of sin that believers have already received through the blood of Christ. So Hebrews 9 says, And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. I love this how it says, If that were necessary, Christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began. What does that mean? It means that people are sinning every day. 
Jesus would have to be dying continually, continually, continually for the sins of the world if we compare his blood to the blood of bulls and goats. Christ would have had to have died again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly wait for him. So when he comes again, he's not coming to deal with our sins because he's already dealt with our sins. When he comes again, he's coming to bring salvation. The word salvation can mean to deliver us, deliverance, physically deliver us, to all who eagerly are waiting for him. So what we need to understand is that the blood of animals could only cover sin. What Jesus did was take them away because there's a difference between sweeping dirt under a rug and actually getting under there with a vacuum and cleaning. And I know these things because I clean, right? So I'm a professional, I'm a professional cleaner. Uh, so it's a difference between sweeping dirt under the rug and vacuuming the dirt and taking it away, right? Jesus took our sins away. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said, exclaimed. So the blood of animals under the old system of law was only a shadow of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. So here we read Colossians 2. It says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is Christ. Hebrews 10.1 says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Now I'm waiting for the new Batman movie that's coming out. They've sent out like, you know, trailers for the new Batman movie. But it's only a dim, it's a preview, man. It's a preview. It's, it's a dim preview of the good things to come. There's going to be a lot of Batman goodness when that comes out. But anyway, we're talking about this. The old system under the Lord Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. Not the good things themselves. All right. So not the good things themselves. Okay, here we are. So see, Christ is the substance. Christ is the reality. He is the good things that were to come. And now we have the reality. We no longer need the shadow. Now that we have the reality, we no longer need the shadow. The idea that we must continually make confession for the forgiveness of sin under the new covenant is actually foreign to the new covenant. And hey, look, I have no problems. I have no problem pouring out my heart to God and telling God I've, I've, you know, I've stuffed up. I've sinned. But at no time am I thinking that I'm out of fellowship with God. I'm free to confess to God, not to be forgiven, but knowing that I'm coming from a position that I am already forgiven. So when you come from that position, there is safety, there is security. You have assurance of your salvation. You are safe in the love of God. And amen, we all are who have called upon the name of the Lord. So what did Paul say? He said, bearing one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Colossians 2. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven, having forgiven you all trespasses, past tense, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way. Can't get any more clearer than that. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We have been crucified with Christ. Amen. But then some might say, yeah, but what about John 1.9? 1 John 1.9. What about 1 John 1.9? This one always comes up when it comes to when it's speaking of confession of sin. This scripture always pops up. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's a good verse. And I remember when it clicked that this verse is not about daily Christian confession of sin, a spiritual bar of soap, you know, that, that uh, cleanses you on a daily basis. But rather, this is about the initial believing on Christ for salvation. This is a salvation verse. Uh, and as we know, when we read the scripture, uh, context is always king. Was John referring to believers? I don't think he was. Who was John referring to then? I believe John was referring to a group of people called uh, Gnostics. And Gnosticism was a major heresy. So here we have Gnosticism actually comes from the word gnosis in Greek. just means knowledge. So this group believed they possessed special, superior, spiritual and esoteric knowledge. Esoteric meaning only to be understood by a small number of people with a specialized knowledge. Right? With a specialized knowledge. Gnostics believed that physical matter was evil. So the chairs you're sitting on, your bodies, everything was, because it's physical, it was evil. Uh, and only that which was immaterial or spiritual or spirit was good. So they believed Jesus did not come into the flesh. And if you read verse 9, you'll see these kind of juxtapositions happening. Um, light and darkness and so forth. Um, they didn't believe, so basically they believed that it was, Jesus was just an illusion. He was just some sort of floaty, you know, uh, incorporeal kind of being floating around. I don't know what they were believing. But they believed he was irrational. But another thing they believed, that because sin was also a part of the physical world, they believed sin didn't exist. You see, if you base your belief systems um, well, if it's not based in reality, it just comes off, it's just highly, highly irrational. It's, it's, um, it's silly. It's similar to the belief that in Christian science, which is neither Christian or scientific, Christian science, that they believe that um, sickness is an illusion. So they believe that, these Gnostics believe that sin was an illusion, didn't exist. Christian science believed that sickness didn't exist. It was an illusion. And it's kind of like a little boy, you know, kind of covers his eyes, and because he can't see you, he thinks that he's invisible, right? He's just, ah, oh, you don't exist. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. Sin doesn't exist. Sin doesn't exist. But just saying it doesn't make it so, because they were deceived. And I have to mention that that's an awfully convenient belief system. I mean, you could indulge your fleshy desires all you want, guilt-free, consequence-free, because sin doesn't really exist. So, what are we looking at here? In 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So basically what we're looking at here is that we're dealing with a group of people that were sin deniers. John is referring to Gnostics, not Christians, in these verses. These sin deniers were living in, well, they weren't living in reality. They were only deceiving themselves and the truth of Christ was not in them. So apparently they believed that they were in fellowship with God, but they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh and they denied that they were sinners. So if we go back, 1 John 1, 5, 7. This is this context. These are the verses before and after. So this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So they claimed they were in fellowship with God, yet they walked in darkness. They were not saved. They were living a lie, and they weren't practicing the truth. But it is only when they chose to walk in the light 
as God is in the light, acknowledge their sin before God, and then and only then could there be a true coming together and a communion take place with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse them of all sin. You see, if you deny that you're a sinner, Jesus came to save sinners. If you deny that you're a sinner, Jesus cannot be your saviour. If you do not acknowledge that you are a sinner. Paul the Apostle said, Jesus, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's what Paul the Apostle said. So what's the point? Well, now when we come to John 1.9, it becomes clear that the verse is not for Christians or for daily cleansing of sin and confession of sin. For the believer, it is not your confession of sin that guarantees your forgiveness before God. And I'm not talking about your initial uh, confession of faith in Christ when you were born again. I'm talking about Christians apologizing to God every time they sin on a daily basis. What has absolutely secured your forgiveness is faith in the blood of Christ. The forgiveness of sin is not apology-based, it's blood-based. Now there is a verse for Christians in 1 John. My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's beautiful. He is a propitiation for our sins. That verse is directed towards the believer. So, this passage is for believers. John uses an intimate term, my little children. It also does, it also does it say that if anyone sins, confess them, and then you're forgiven. So if, any of, so if anyone sins, confess them, then you're forgiven. And fellowship with God is restored. Does it say that? Just say you're sorry, beg God for forgiveness, and then you're in again. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. It says the focus goes back to what Christ did. He is our lawyer, our counsellor, our advocate before the Father. He himself was the one who satisfied our sin debt before God. And that is what is meant by propitiation. And I think a beautiful picture is in the life of Abraham. When God tested his faith, uh, commanding him to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, he was told by God to go to the mount that he would reveal. He was told to go to the land of Moriah. Abraham did not delay or argue with God or shake his fists at God, demanding why God, why? Like I've seen in some of these um, Bible movies about Abraham. Nope, he started the very next morning. He headed out the very next morning on the journey and three days later, he arrived at Moriah, at the mount that God showed him. But here we see in Genesis that when he was with his son Isaac, his son Isaac seemed a little confused. So we read, so Abraham, looked, uh, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the, the fire and the wood, and, but where is the lamb for burnt sacrifice for, or for burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. What a man of faith Abraham was. God will provide the lamb for sacrifice. And we know that Abraham passed the test Isaac was spared. The angel of the Lord stopped Abraham from going through with it. But the Lord is gracious. He provided a sacrifice. As we see here, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So we've heard of the name of God 
the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is a term that has been used to say that God will provide for us in a, in a general sense. For example, some will declare that, he, that God will uh, provide for our financial needs and our healing, etc. And I'm not, I'm not at all knocking that kind of application at all because God definitely is our provider. But his name, Jehovah Jireh, is also and is actually a prophetic name as the name that speaks of Christ the Messiah who would come to be the ultimate sacrifice. And it's interesting to note that when Moses wrote these words, remember Moses wrote the book of Genesis, that there was a saying that extended all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and that particular account. It says, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided and I believe, and this is my personal belief, that 2,000 years later, on that same mountain, God did provide for himself a sacrifice. Mount Moriah today is Zion, or Jerusalem today. Jesus was crucified outside of the city of Jerusalem, and perhaps Golgotha, or Calvary, where Jesus was crucified, is perhaps the same mountain where Abraham's faith was tested and where God provided a substitute. Could be. And another observation was that at the time, it was not a lamb that Abraham sacrificed in place of his son Isaac. It was a ram. It says there. So Abraham went and took the ram. Uh, so Abraham was not referring to, the to that immediate sacrifice at the time, but to a future sacrifice. And what did Jesus say? Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. So Christ's sacrifice satisfied the justice of God, propitiation. So if Jesus' once for all sacrifice satisfied God, then that should satisfy us too. I love to preach the great exchange, or the grace exchange. That all our sin was charged to Christ, imputed to Christ, and all God's righteousness was charged to us who put our faith in the finished work of Jesus. You see, I believe in works-based salvation. Ooh. But not my works, not your works, but the finished work of Christ. So yes, our sins, past, present, and future, were all forgiven when we believed. And again, my main man, Andrew, he says, we're told that God forgave us and that our sins have been forgiven. To understand this better, consider the question, how many of your sins were in the future when Christ died? All of them, right? Yes. So God looked down the timeline of your sins, past, present, and future, and he took them all away at once. God made no distinction about the time of occurrence. Amen. All our sins were future sins when Jesus died and he dealt with them 2,000 years ago on the cross. Religion wants us to remember your sins. Religion wants us to be introspective, self-conscious, self-focused. What grace wants us to focus on is Jesus cross-focused, Christ-conscious. We are the righteousness of God-conscious because God remembers our sin no more. And this is a part of my message, our sins forgiven and forgotten. Hebrews says, For by that one offering he forever made perfect, forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that it is that this is so, for he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. There is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Praise God for the new covenant. 
It's right there. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifice. It is finished. Tetelestai. It is finished. See, God remembers our sins no more because the blood of Christ washed them all away. And I know that some people balk at the idea that all our sins have been forgiven because they still believe that they have something to offer God, something that merits being forgiven. Our apology, our acts of devotion to God, our Bible reading, our prayer time, it's all good. But the focus is always on me, 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 you, 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 me, me, me. But again, that just leads to introspection, navel-gazing. And when you start to focus on you, it becomes obvious that you don't measure up to God's standard. Because if you look hard enough, you discover that we're all messed up. So, we can never put our trust in our ability or in our flesh to please God. Our ability to earn forgiveness, you can't trust it. That will either lead to pride, because we think we're actually doing really good, or it leads to sadness and depression and guilt and shame because we're not measuring up, we feel. And I know that some Christians fear this message of total forgiveness because some would believe that this would lead to Christians feeling like they can go out and start breaking world records for sin. The whole license, for, old license to sin deal. But that's just a misunderstanding of the grace of God. We have the living Christ in us and it is his grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Oh, how we need to trust in the Lord Jesus, his grace is all sufficient. This message of total forgiveness should fill our hearts with joy, thanksgiving, gratitude and wholehearted worship. And as I finish up, I want us to meditate on the truth that God has already given and forgotten all your sins. The expression ask forgiveness and ask for forgiveness are nowhere to be found in any New Testament letter. Why would we ask God to do what has already been done? Amen. So these final verses I would like to share with you from the Old Testament, which echoes truth that we're living in right now. Right now in the New Covenant. The Lord here is comforting Israel but these are beautiful passages of scripture that can be applicable to the church as well. And they are filled with, like, with new covenant truth. And I love these. Psalm 103, it says, He does not punish us for our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins from us as the east is from the west, the two shall never meet. Behold his unfailing love towards us. In Micah 7, 18 to 20, where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of a special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever. I love that God is not angry with us. Because you delight in showing unfailing love once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestors, Abraham and Jacob, long ago. Amen. Those are beautiful, beautiful passages of Scripture. Amen. We thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, Lord, that you satisfy the justice of God, the wrath of God, so that we can come into relationship with you, that we can have that intimate relationship with you. And Lord God, we thank you that all of our sins, past, present and future, have been forgiven and forgotten by you. And Lord, we know, Lord God, that we can stand secure and safe Lord, in the palm of your hand. 
and we can have assurance of our salvation and we can walk in confidence and boldness as we know, Lord, that we are lifted up and undergirded by the power of the Holy Spirit in us this morning. And we thank you in your wonderful name. Amen. And just before we do finish up, I really felt uh, in the Lord to, to give an opportunity for people you know, whether on here or on Zoom, maybe not so much here, but definitely maybe perhaps on Zoom or, or on YouTube, because this message is going out. Uh, that there may be some here who may have never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Perhaps you are not sure that you have received this total forgiveness that I've been talking about uh, today. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But the bad news is, is that our sin separates us from ever being able to come to God. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have, been, have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So being born again is necessary because every human being is born with a sinful nature which we inherited from Adam when he sinned in the garden. And when he fell, the entire human race fell in him. And we were separated from God, rebels, all placed under the wrath of God. And yes, we do deserve hell apart from Christ. Scripture says in Romans 5.12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So mankind has this propensity or this bent towards sin and it manifests itself in various ways. You just need to watch the news and you can see that. So in effect, our sinful behavior does not make us a sinner. We sin because we are sinners by nature. That's, why, that's what the cross dealt with, our sinful nature. The cross dealt with the root of the problem, our sin nature. And his blood was shed for us for the cleansing of all our sins. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. And God wants to give us a new nature so that we can draw near to him and be reconciled to him, to be free to relate to him and to love him. But I love what, uh, oh, I don't have it here, but I love the scripture. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So we were separated from God when we were sinners in Adam. But in Christ, we are reconciled. We can draw near to our Heavenly Father. And this is made possible through faith in Christ. Putting your trust in Jesus. And putting your trust in what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection. The Apostle Paul said, but what, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so my heart today is if there is anyone who wants to make a confession of faith in Christ, to know the peace of God that goes beyond human understanding, to be set free, forgiven from all sin, and know that they have assurance of salvation, I'm going to pray a simple prayer of salvation, and you can simply repeat after me. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me, for the forgiveness of my sin. I believe and confess that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. 
and believe in my heart that you, Father, raised him from the dead. And so according to your word, I am now born again and have assurance that I am saved. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer with me, you are saved. But the good news doesn't stop there. According to the Apostle Paul, he preached, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all the things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Yes, your sins are forgiven, but you've also been justified, which means God has declared you righteous before him. And Phil said this, So now that when you stand before God, you are just as righteous as Jesus is righteous in God's presence because you are now clothed in the righteousness of God. And my favorite verse, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In him. And please, if you, if you pray that play, uh, prayer, um, you know, please don't hesitate to get in contact with either myself or Roz and Dave and uh, Ken and uh, we'll be more than happy to resource you as you grow uh, in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.